Hello readers, Kim here with Native Lady Bookwire and I am happy to tell you that I will be sharing my bookish thoughts, likes, and loves for Stephen Graham Jones' novella, Mapping the, Mapping the Interior. So, alrighty, let's go then. <laughs> Okay, so before we get started, I want to share that I am currently racing to finish my October TBRs because Indigathon is almost here, yay! I can see it, it's just right over there and I gotta finish my October read. So I'm trying to get that done or either transition them into being my reads for Indigathon or maybe even putting them off to December, but anyways, I'll be linking videos for Indigathon up above and below, and then also look into the description for those Twitter and IG prompts and feeds and for more information if you guys want to participate for Indigathon. So, quick snap recap. Mapping the Interior is a horror, psychological thrill thriller, a paranormal <laughs> novella. But you know what? Let's not worry about all the labeling because I'm pretty bad at it. I'll just say that this book deeply disturbed me. It's thoroughly stuck in my brain. The book is from the perspective of a 12 year old native boy who is experiencing the haunting of his deceased father. Junior is the protagonist in this book and he is a boy that is growing up so fast because of the challenges he is facing. One being his family's financial struggles and two being his little brother Dino's um, mental cognitive condition. On top of that, Junior's grief is very apparent and he is trying to fill this hole where his dad used to be so whether that's by asking questions or just missing him but he comes out of that process with just more questions or dismay when junior experiences that first sight of his father it's creepy <laughs> And descriptive and that sighting is paired with memories uh, and the, at the end of that sighting it almost feels promising and I'll, I'll read it this is a statement he makes after seeing his father for that very first time that's how you talk about dead people though especially dead Indians it's all about squandered potential not actual accomplishments my father my dad he could have had he could have been the best fancy dancer of us all and that's how I recognized him that first night, crossing from the living room through the kitchen, his boots, his bustle, his fancy dancer outline. In death, he had become what he never could in life. And now he was back, or he had been for a few steps. My heart pounded in my chest with what I wanted to call fear, but what I know now was actually hope. That really small glimpse into his dad being introduced for the first time and how Junior feels about him and his reappearance is, is really interesting. Reading that first glimpse into what it's like to be in this kid's head, I knew I was in for something pretty good. Another thing I enjoyed about this book is the surrender it required. In Joan's work, you are very much along for the ride and therefore you're much more easily susceptible to shock and horror and thrills without any kind of warning. I got really comfortable and I felt sometimes at ease with what was going on in the story and I got comfortable into the head of Junior. So when he was trapped under that house in that dirt crawl space with these dogs digging to tear him apart I, f I felt trapped too I felt panicked and I also felt the horror of his dad's ghost like ripping apart those dogs what disturbed me on top of that right on top of all of that was when he woke and the dogs were covered like their eyes were covered and that part was next level creepy because 
it wasn't explained, but it was this really odd, eerie event that and that took place. It was next level creepy. <laughs> I realized like this entity, this dad was malicious and, and disturbing. Then in the middle of all this horror that's happening, Junior's family is going through so much. Their, their mom is hanging on to her job by a thread. There's these long hospital visits. There's this infuriating bullying and abuse that's going on against Dino. There's also this studying deteriorating mental cognition of Dino, the financial circumstances, the absence of no support like friends or family, and then finally Junior's desperation of wanting his dad to be there is kind of connecting all of these things like this spider web that they're trapping themselves in thinking that's going to be the solution to their problems but it's not and then that scene that unsettling scene of his dad feeding off Dino oh my gosh that was <laughs> so I'm gonna read it really quick what I saw nearly made me pull the trigger shoot my foot off Dad, my dear's dead father, he was leaned over Dino, had maybe been listening to his heart or whispering into his mouth. His fingertips were to the either side of Dino's sleeping shape, and he had one knee on the bed and one foot on the ground, and he was looking across the room like an animal, right into my soul. His eyes shone, not with light, but with a kind of wet darkness. The mouth, too. No, the lips and curling up from them was smoke from the cigarettes and ashes I funneled behind the skirt. That part <laughs> scared me. I think after I read that part, I dropped my book and I took a break. I was like, uh, okay, I, uh, I, I'm, um, I need a drink. <laughs> and I thought about it, that this dad or this whatever he was, was siphoning off them. He was feeding off their vulnerabilities and their weaknesses. And, and that part really stuck with me. And I thought it to be kind of symbolic that sometimes you have to protect family from family, that you yourself or, or anybody would do anything to keep those who you love safe, even if it means killing somebody who could be your dad. And even if it means surrendering and giving up something you thought you wanted so badly and coming to terms with yourself, like this mirror of what you thought you needed and this realization, realization of chasing after what never could be and really not seeing what that you could lose what you've had in front of you this whole time and you come to these truths right like for like for instance me in that situation i would have thought of myself as selfish or unappreciative of what i had but instead really focusing on what i lost but when you're a 12 year old kid you don't, you don't make those kind of distinctions. You just think about how you feel and how, not really how you're going to cope with those things. The dead body, <laughs> the physical makeup of that ghost dad freaked me out that this dad wasn't wearing this fancy dancer regalia, but all those things were a part of him they were growing out of him and for me when I was reading that part where those dogs were just tearing up tearing apart the the dad's bodies I I thought of like a, a insect like how those things are were like this protective shell of him and it that those vengeful zombie dogs ripping him apart Desert that disturbed me, but it also was horrifying in a way that 
well for me i was thinking his dad wearing those things like him physically appearing that way was almost like this spiritual seduction or this cultural illusion like kind of a way of gaining junior's trust to something that he didn't have but maybe something he wanted his father to have or maybe something that he wanted to have so there's layers of complexity when it came to culture and identity in this story and it was intimate the examples of being native or or being indigenous and carrying that with grief was such a reality that i connected to in different ways not like the same way because what well, we'll hope is we don't we don't do powwows we don't we don't do those dances where we're from but i guess in a way i was trying to connect on some level and it, it it freaked me out so i just i just said to myself okay kim don't go there it was painful and authentic and i found those parts to be deep especially at the end when junior becomes a fancy dancer himself there's this universal colorful symbolism in this book especially when it comes to cycles right and mostly those intergenerational cycles that we don't wish to repeat like for example junior following in the absent footsteps of his father but also junior's son or colin mirroring the death of his grandfather uh, dying young and in this case where alcohol is not that far away so those last pages in this book were like a punch to the gut i was like what did i just read like what did i just experience and the story seems to pick right back up where it started it, it, but instead of junior defeating his defenseless trusting brother junior is delivering him on this platter and it reminded me of the movie pet cemetery that that ending right and the love and the desperation of the father in that movie or in, uh, in that book driving him to make all of these awful <laughs> decisions because his pain and grief is just too much to bear and junior was ready to part with his brother by committing this awful unforgivable act to get back his son and the story it just ends it ends before we can get any answers or or before we can see like if his son does come back but the knowing right the knowing is like the haunting part. The fact that knowing it, it, what is being laid down or what is being offered up, the knowing of seeing someone lose their humanity so painfully and heartbreakingly. <sighs> okay, wow. <laughs> this book was so good. I recommend this to your friends. Um, so my discussion is over. I hope you guys are all well. I hope you guys are excellent and until next time, Kim here with Native Lady Bookwear and I shall see you all soon. So thank you for watching the video and don't forget to get your reads ready for Indigathon. So bye! <laughs>